Hey there. Welcome to the Complete Solo Lane Guide Season 6 update. The new season has brought a surprising amount of changes to the solo lane and to the game in general, so if you do enjoy and learn something from this guide then be sure to leave a rating and consider subscribing so you don't miss the other 4 role guides coming shortly. And finally, if you want to discuss these guides and videos, find people to play with or just hang out in general, check out my community discord server linked below. Okay, let's get right into the contents of what I'm going to cover in the guide. As always, timestamps will be on screen and in a pinned comment for those who want to skip to a specific section. If you're already well versed in Conquest, I would suggest skipping the first section since it is kind of basic. Okay so we started off with a basic overview of the role, what skills you need to be a successful solo laner and what your role is in the team. After that will be the gods and items section where I'll discuss the most successful solo lane god picks and what items are best for them. Following that will be a larger section about the dynamics of the laning phase in solo lane. This section covers a ton of different stuff such as boxing, farming correctly, early rotations, the totem of coup and more. I'll be splitting this section up into these smaller subsections to make it a little bit easier to follow once we get there. And finally we'll round out the guide with how to play team fights as a solo laner including zoning, diving, when to peel and also a bit on general team play like taking objectives, sieging and defending sieges once you're out of the laning phase. Okay, so let's dive right into it with the basic overview of solo lane. Alright, so the solo laner in Conquest resides in the solo lane. This can be a bit misleading since mid is also a solo lane by definition, but solo lane is defined as the side lane closest to the fire giant. It's also the lane where the two towers are closer together compared to the duo lane over here by the gold fury. The job of the solo laner is usually to provide frontline presence for the team and thus the solo laner is usually a tanky character. You'll be farming your lane trying to gain a lead in any way you can so that once you rotate from your lane you're ready to fight with your team. Solo lane requires good knowledge of farming, aka gaining XP and gold quickly, how to box enemies, basically the 1v1 slap fight, and how to play frontline tanks while in team fights later on. It does also help to have knowledge of a variety of gods and matchups since solo is a very diverse role, but this does just come with a lot of experience until we're in the role really. Okay, so with the basics out of the way, let's move on to what god picks you should be looking at for solo lane and how to build them. So as I've touched on in the previous section, solo lane is for the most part a role for tanky characters that provide a frontline presence to the team. There are exceptions to this, but a vast majority of the time you'll be playing and playing against tanks. This includes every warrior in the game, some are better than others, but you really can't go wrong with any warrior in solo lane, it's their main role. Many guardians work as well though, mostly ones with a good sustain and wave clear potential to maximise their farm and spend less time recalling. The most notable solo lane guardian picks as of recording this are Arceo, Athena, Kabraken, Cerberus, Kuzumbo, Sobek, Terra, Jingchen, and likely Jormungandr as well, though he is a recent release as of recording. Others can work, for example Ymir, Sylvanas, or Kumbakana, but for the most part the 8 I just mentioned are the ones you're going to be seeing the most consistent play of in solo lane. As you'll notice, all of these guardians I've mentioned above have average wave clear and most have reliable sustain. These are two extremely important characteristics for a solo lane god. Similar to guardians, some assassins can also work when built tanky in the solo lane though they are a lot less common than warriors and guardians, for example Kamazots, Ratatoska, Bakasura or Fenrir. As for mages, they're very uncommon in solo lane for the most part. Some oddball picks like Baron Samdi, Aquash or Jeanqui can be very successful in solo lane though, along with some sustained mages like Hell. Hunters really don't see enough successful play in solo to warrant me covering them really, just focus on these other gods that I have mentioned. Okay, so as for items and builds for these gods, as you probably saw, solo is extremely diverse and there's not a chance I can cover a build for every viable god in one video. So instead I'm just going to cover the items for warriors and guardians since they make up over 90% of solo lane matchups most of the time anyway. If you're playing something outside of these picks, you'll probably need to look up a build elsewhere for them. So I'll quickly cover blessings, potion choices and relics before going into proper items. So for blessings, Things, Warrior's Blessing is back to being very powerful this season. Of course I can't predict how this item will fare 6 months down the line, but right now it's a worth pickup on most Warriors and some Guardians. The other option for very defensive picks that have a hard time clearing wave early on, for example Sobek or Baron Samdi, Guardian's Blessing is still doable. Just make sure you avoid last sitting minions while you stack it. Other blessings see minor play, but not really enough to warrant a discussion. For potions, Health Chalice is extremely useful in solo lane. Having 750 HP on demand whenever you're back is hard to compete with. If you have the spare gold in your starting build, I highly recommend buying this. Otherwise, just get health potions and maybe a couple of multi potions. Mana potions are usually unnecessary in solo due to blue buff and the totem of coup which we'll cover later, giving you a ton of mana sustain. Okay and for relics, most solo learners use teleport as their first relic right now. Being able to back to base for free without really missing any farm is very powerful. 
Forgoing teleport is risky, but is sometimes done on certain picks. And then for your other relic, usually this wants to be a team fighting relic, especially if you're on a tanky warrior or guardian. So shell, heavenly wings, or horrific emblem. But on some gods, I do also like blink. For example, Kukulun makes good use of it with his blink engage with his ultimate. Other relics are very niche and see very little play right now. Okay, so here's a few examples of starting builds for solo lane. For a warrior, get warrior's blessing, tier one boots, and a chalice of healing with teleport as your relic. And for a guardian, simply use this build and swap out warrior's blessing for guardian's blessing. Okay, so onto your actual items for the build. So for most warriors, warrior tabai is the way to go. The early 40 power is extremely useful for trading and wave clear. However, some auto attack focused warriors like Bologna or Erlang Shen, for example, will use ninja tabi effectively. For guardians, shoes of focus are usually your go-to. Giving extra mana and cooldown reduction for sustain and boxing, plus the 55 power is really nice. Though sometimes Shoes of the Magi are also viable on very aggressive Guardians looking for early kills. So for early physical defense in lane, Breastplate of Valor is still universally powerful on almost any ability based warrior and basically every Guardian as well. The extra mana is nice and of course 20% CDR and the physical defense are always going to be useful. However, if you are an ability based warrior, you can also grab Gladiator Shield. This item is most effective on gods with many wide hitting damage abilities on low cooldowns. For example, Sun Wukong, King Arthur, or Kukulun. Of course, this item isn't available to Guardians though since it does come with physical power. And if you're looking for early magical defense, Pestilence is my go-to if they have any kind of healing, for example against a Baron or an Arteo. Even just reducing a little bit of self-healing is makes this item worth it, I think. But you could also try Genji's Guard if they have no healing whatsoever and you want that extra cooldown reduction. And Voidstone is amazing, but similarly to Gladiator Shield, this item is only available to magical characters, so Guardians and Mages, you can't build this on Warriors. And if you're looking for a mix of both types of defense, Hide of the Urchin, Spirit Robe, and Mantle of Discard are all great a bit later on in the build usually. Outside these items, you're mostly building to counter the enemy team. So items like Mid Guardian Mail, Witchblade and Nemean Lion to counter auto attack focus gods, Wingblade to counter slows, Pestilence to counter healers, all that kind of stuff. And finally, if you want to be a bit more aggressive from solo lane, some offensive items can work, but I would usually limit yourself to only one of these maximum in most games. You need to be extremely tanky for team fights to do your job effectively, and you're mostly better off building cooldown reduction and tankiness to survive and spam your cooldowns rather than building more damage. Void Shield is a nice hybrid defense and offense item. Masamune is usually my go-to on Warriors for damage. Damage. It gives really good all rounded stats with health, protections, power, and movement speed all on the same item. And for magical specific gods, Ethereal Staff is usually my go to for more damage. Alright, so let's close out this section with a few example builds for both Warriors and Guardians. For Warriors, Warrior Tabai, Breastplate of Valor, Spirit Robe, Pestilence, Mid Guardian Mail, Mantle of Discord. And if the game goes long enough, you can sell your boots for Masamune and get the Elixir of Speed. And for Guardians, Shoes of Focus, Breastplate of Valor, Void Stone, Hide of the Urchin, Big Guardian Mail, Mantle of Discord, and once again, later in the game, you can sell your boots for Ethereal Staff and get the Elixir of Speed. Okay, so with items and gods covered, let's move on to the dynamics of the laning phase. So as I mentioned earlier, this section is going to be split up into a few different subsections, as there's a lot to cover about the laning phase in solo. It's definitely the most important part of being a solo laner. So I'll be covering Minion Mastery, Level 1 Fighting, Boxing and Trades, Ganks and Warding Tips, Advanced Farming Techniques, The Totem of Coup, and finally, when to recall. Okay, so let's kick off this section with Minion Mastery. It's a fancy name, but in reality, I just mean that as a solo laner, manipulating minions to your advantage is key. Using your own minions in the best way possible, and farming enemy minions in the most efficient way possible. Having a good idea of how much damage minions will put out through the laning phase is extremely useful. Especially early on, minions can really chunk you, but we'll do the same to the enemy. So you can choose to aggro enemy minions, taking additional damage yourself, but stopping them from targeting your wave and therefore increasing your clear speed at the cost of taking some poke. Likewise, if an enemy employs this tactic against you, it might be worth going on them to poke them out heavily, allowing you to secure other things like your blue buff or the totem of coup. It's all about analysing your current matchup in solo. More than any other role, knowing what the enemy can do to you is just as important as knowing what you can do to the enemy. If you're facing a mage with no warrior's blessing, and they pull minions, they're going to take a ton of damage from that, so be looking to maybe take the fight and you might get an early first blood. But if your opponent is a tanky warrior with warrior's blessing for example, they're going to take way less damage on those minions and it might not be worth going for the fight. Another major thing to note with minions is that the archers at the back do over two thirds of the way's total damage output. And they're also a hell of a lot easier to kill than melee minions as well, so a lot of the time it can be worth just focusing down those archers, at which point you've crippled the wave's damage output to a point where it's almost negligible and you can take the fight or just clean up the rest of the wave safely. Be very careful aggressing into a full wave with three archers, they can really chunk you early on, even into warrior's blessing. So as you probably guessed, minions are the main source of farm you'll be getting in solo lane. You have the full lane to yourself most of the time, so getting that farm from each wave is critical to success in solo. 
Never leave a wave to die when you're not there unless you absolutely have to. Of course, you'll get that little bit of extra farm from blue buff, totem, maybe back camps, but the majority of your farm comes from these guys, so prioritise the wave, and once that's done, you can look elsewhere like totem, invades, recalling, stuff like that that we'll cover more in detail later. That way you can maximise your farm, get a lead, and then impact team fights in a big way once you join the team. Alright, moving on to the level 1 laning fight. It might seem a bit much to have an entire section dedicated to one level, but this first wave or two of the game can often decide the rest of the laning phase. If you misplay this, it can lead to a rough lane, and if you capitalise on an enemy misplay, you can get a huge leg up for the rest of the laning phase. It's extremely high risk, high reward to look for fights at this point in the game. The most important factors in the level 1 fight are your wave clear and your boxing potential. So a fast clearing god like Bologna will often clear faster than their opponent and be free to force a fight, get their blue buff, or even set up for an invade while the enemy has to deal with the rest of the wave. And if you're on the losing end of wave clear, you'll likely have to play it safe and avoid fighting the enemy, as fighting an enemy and their wave at level 1 is likely to result in getting first blooded. If you're losing clear at level 1, you should probably just try and get as many minions as you can and safely get to your own blue buff to get level 2. Sometimes fights will occur at level 1, which is where playing a good boxing god is useful. For example, Hercules gets 18 bonus power from his passive at level 1, meaning he's a monster to box early on, and will often be looking to take fights in those early learning phases. Alright, moving on to boxing in general, not just at level 1. It's inevitable that at some point in solo lane you will be trading blows with your lane opponent. It's important to know when you should be looking for these fights and when you should be avoiding them. Generally, if you're losing clear, you should avoid fights early on. Because as I've mentioned earlier, minions really hurt and fighting into a full wave as well as the enemy solo is usually a bad idea. And if you're the one winning the clear, pay attention to the enemy's mannerisms. If they seem like they push up a lot and try and get the wave, just box with them and you'll likely win and get some nice poking, either forcing them back to lose gold to tower or maybe even landing a kill. Just as with wave clear, certain gods will be better boxers than others. For example, a Sobek is going to have a hard time boxing a Bologna in the laning phase. Being a Guardian, he has weaker damage output in general and a slow attack chain. Whereas Bologna has many basic attack augments, disarms, and high basic attack power in general, and also harder hitting abilities. Knowing when to box and when not to comes with experience and learning matchups mostly, but a general rule is that if you're behind, you should avoid boxing if you can and just get as much farm as you possibly can. Of course, if you're at full health and you're trying to put down an enemy for a gank or something, that's fine, but in general, if an enemy has more items and levels than you, they're going to outtrade you in fights which will result in you getting poked out, meaning you'll probably have to play extremely passive or back to base both of which will likely result in lost farm, putting you even further behind. And then the snowball just keeps rolling at that point. Just try to focus on securing wave XP and gold over fighting if you're behind and or are on a bad god for boxing like a guardian. And of course, all that applies in reverse to you if you had the lead or are playing the boxing heavy god. Force the issue, make them back and lose farm, put them so low that your jungler can clean them up for a free kill. Do whatever you can to make staying in lane inconvenient and or risky for them. Even if these trades don't directly result in kills, you'll be putting them behind and getting yourself an even bigger lead, so when you start to rotate properly to teamfights, you can make a huge impact. The further you can put them behind in lane, the easier the mid to late game will be for you and for your team. So I'll always be looking for these opportunities to punish enemies. Alright, next up, warding and ganks. Ganks can happen at any time and in any situation, not just because you're winning lane and the enemy jungler has to come over. Even if you're even or losing lane, you still need to be wary of ganks, both from the enemy team and from your own. I've seen too many solo laners that aren't paying attention to a friendly jungle gank and mess it up. But the harder part for sure is playing against enemy ganks. Of course, wards are your first line of defense. If you can see the gank coming a few seconds before it hits, you have a better chance of reacting correctly. Here's a few good solo lane ward spots that I like. The solo laner is usually the least likely to ward because they're less afraid of ganks like these, but it is useful to have some up at all times if you can. Wards won't prevent ganks entirely on their own though, so it's the information these wards give you that allow you to decide the avenue to take on that gank. For those who don't play solo too much, this may seem like a bit of a foreign concept, but fighting into a gank 1v2 is the correct play more often than you would think it is in solo. With how defense is, oftentimes you'll be building defense to counter the enemy solo, and by proxy you will also be countering the enemy jungler as well. Quick example, you're learning against a warrior and you build breastplate of valor second item. Since most junglers are physical, you're extremely tanky against both gods in this situation. So if you're playing a god that's good at fighting and you have a lead, I say go for it. The amount of times I've turned an enemy gank into a return kill or even two is actually crazy. Be confident in your ability and you'll often come out on top in these situations. Even if it doesn't result in some kind of kill, you'll end up wasting the jungler's time while they try to kill you, where they could be farming, and your jungler might even be able to counter gank you or mid while the jungler is busy slap fighting you to no avail. Never underestimate how effective it is to just waste someone's time in this game. Obviously, this isn't always the case though. Sometimes, especially if you're behind or playing a defensive god, the best choice is to simply back off. If you can make it to tower, likelihood is they won't bother diving you unless you've already poked out already. 
And usually the tower is a pretty safe haven. Okay, let's get a little more in depth here and cover some advanced laning tactics. So one of the flagship farming tactics a lot of people ask about is proxy farming. So this basically just means farming enemy minions behind their standing towers. By nature, this is extremely high risk, but also high reward. You're putting yourself pretty out of position with few ways out if you do get caught, but meeting wave behind the tier one tower rather than waiting for it to come to the middle of the lane as normal will save you some time that you can put to use elsewhere. You can invade blue buff, back camps, secure totem, recall to base, rotate to mid, you get my point. There's a lot of stuff you can do in the time you save while proxy farming. Since the enemy laner will likely have to stand in lane waiting for your wave and they can't contest your invade, follow your rotation, things like that. This tactic is mostly employed when you can clear the wave quickly and get out safely. So proxying at level 3 as Sobek is probably a bad idea, but once you get some points into your wave clear abilities and get some defense online, proxy farming can be a very effective way to build a lead or push the lead that you already have. Just remember to be wary of the enemy team's positionings and have wards up if you can when you're going to do this. Alright, so on to lane freezing. This tactic is, in my opinion, less useful than proxy farming, but often applicable in most of your games. This tactic basically involves letting minions kill each other in the lane without interacting with them. You don't clear them, you just make sure you're in range to still get XP and gold. This is mostly useful when you don't want the lane to push towards the enemy and you want to freeze it in place, that's where the name comes from. If they're out of lane for a short time, like grabbing their blue buff, you can freeze the lane so some of your minions die while they're out of lane to enemy minions and they don't get the farm because they obviously weren't in lane. Whereas if you just had pushed that wave towards the tower, they still would have got credit for most of the minions in XP and sometimes gold as well. Whereas if minions die while they're out of lane, they get absolutely nothing. This can also be useful in a more aggressive way, sometimes this is also called zoning. You essentially keep the enemy away from the minions as you freeze the lane. If you can keep them fully out of range, they gain nothing while you still gain the farm as you're in range. This is a very aggressive tactic and it's mostly done when you're vastly ahead and can easily win a fight. Doing this will often induce a gank from the enemy jungler to try and help out the enemy solo a bit, so be aware of that as well. Alright, so let's cover the new objective this season, the Totem of Coup. So this totem is a completely passive objective aimed specifically at solo laners. Sometimes junglers may rotate to help secure it as well, but for the most part this is taken by you and you alone. So this this functions differently to your typical objectives and jungle buffs. As I mentioned, it's passive, so it won't attack you back and also has no leash range, so you can attack it from any range and still get credit. Damage you do to this will fill up a meter in blue and once that meter reaches full, you will have claimed the totem for your team, giving all 5 members 25 gold each and a buff that gives a small amount of movement speed and 25 mp5 for 10 seconds. It also empowers your towers and walking into their range will refresh this buff's duration. However, it's not that simple. Enemies can also do damage to the totem which will fill up their own separate bar in red, and it's basically a race to whoever fills the bar first. Unlike jungle buffs and other objectives, this can't be stolen from you, it's just a matter of who can pump in the most amount of damage fastest to get to the required number. So naturally, gods with higher damage output and also ranged gods have a slight advantage. Anyone who can quickly throw some damage in between waves or something without committing too much will do well at securing the totem. However, you can also just bully people out of it. A hunter, for example, has high damage basic attacks from range, so you would think they're good at securing totem. But if a warrior can just threaten to kill them for even trying to contest it, then it's not really a viable strategy. So you've got to have pressure and be willing to fight for it to get the totem. I see a lot of people on both ends of the spectrum with how to take this, probably because it's so new this season. Some people massively overcommit and just take way too much poke to get it, and others just ignore it completely when, even when they have free time and give up its benefits. Generally, I prioritise my wave over the totem. A full wave of minions is usually worth more than the totem benefits, so don't go missing an entire wave just to secure this, but try to clear as fast as possible and then go for it in between waves while the enemy is still busy. It's also okay just to give it up sometimes. If you're on a very defensive guardian for example, it's highly unlikely you can contest a warrior for totem early on, so just try to snag it if they go back or go for blue or something, and vice versa, if you're on the aggressive pick that can out secure your enemy. Just take it as much as you possibly can to get your team a lead, and if the enemy comes to contest, just beat the hell out of them. The totem spawns at 1 minute in, so usually right as you're coming back to lane from grabbing the first blue buff, and will respawn 1 minute after it's taken with more and more health each time. So generally, after about 12 minutes or so, it gets quite hard to kill and not really worth the investment, assuming it's been taken regularly throughout the early game. But if it's the only thing you can possibly do, it's still worth getting after that. And at 15 minutes, the totem despawns entirely. Alright, so let's close out this section with a little bit about recalling. So with solo lane being being such a farm focused role, minimizing how much you recall is essential to keeping up in XP and gold. Of course, most solos build teleport which gives you one free back every 200 seconds, but beyond that, back into base wastes a lot of time where you could be farming or taking objectives. 
Generally, the best time to recall is straight after clearing a wave, maybe even straight after proxying a wave. That way you have some extra time before the next wave comes in and you'll miss less. That's the ideal situation though, sometimes you get poked out too much or ganged and are forced back, in which case there's not really much you could do about it, other than just maybe trying to hold out for teleport or something like that. Alright, so let's close out this guide with some stuff about team play and team fighting as a solo laner. So as with a few other parts of this guide, I can't cover how to team fight as every single god that can possibly see play in solo. Thus, I'm going to be coming at this from the angle of the typical solo lane tank, so warrior or guardian. If you're playing something off meta like a hunter or something, obviously you have to adjust your playstyle accordingly for team fights. Okay, so as a solo lane tank, your primary role in team fighting is to be a frontline. Usually this means creating space and causing chaos in the enemy backline to bring attention away from your own carry gods. Depending on the time in the game and how far ahead you are, you can often solo enemy mages and hunters. But even if you can't do that, keeping them busy, CCing them and doing some damage will make them throw that kit on you instead of your mage for example, and that leaves your mage to just like run free and go ham. Sometimes though, solo laners can also help with peeling. Usually support focuses more on that, but in some situations, peeling to keep a carry alive is actually more useful than chasing the enemy backline around. Your role for taking objectives and sieging is similar. You're usually there to zone enemies and keep them away to prevent them defending or stealing an objective from your team. Sometimes you may also have to tank objectives if the support or ADC with lifesteal can't, but usually you are best used to zone. Also, you're usually the prime player to tank towers and phoenixes if needed, since you're often building the most defense on the team and can tank hits for days while your team burns it down. Alright, so that's everything I wanted to talk about for this guide. If there's still anything you guys want to know about solo lane, then be sure to leave a comment and either me or some other filthy solo main will get back to you. If you did enjoy and learned something from this, then be sure to drop a like and subscribe so you don't miss other role guides coming soon and all my other stuff on this channel, and I'll catch you guys later. Peace out, you nerds.